to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. But the government isn't. The government is not focused on your financial freedom. And rightfully so, the government has really no place with your financial freedom. No, that's, that's not the purpose of government. In spite of what people in this country will tell you, in spite of how people have reinvented the Constitution, your financial freedom is not the responsibility of the government. I mean, think about it. Is the government responsible for your financial freedom? There are people in this country that would tell you, yes. Yes, the government is responsible for my financial freedom. As a matter of fact, the government is responsible for my financial security. The government needs to take care of me. And I think that kind of thinking, well, I just think it's bad. And I think there are too many people in this country that think that way. And when we went into this lockdown thing, I think even more people embrace that concept. And now today, as we're emerging from the lockdown, we have people that are firmly convinced that the government is responsible for their financial freedom. After all, what happened during the the pandemic? The government swooped in and sent you checks. They sent you money you didn't even ask for. Did they penalize you on your income tax return? I don't think they did. So the government actually sent you back maybe some of the money that you've paid in. But not everybody pays into the system. And when people that do pay into the system, there's, there's a big concern about, well, who's, who's paying what and how much is coming out of your pocket versus coming out of my pocket? And we get all caught up in all of this minutia. And then what do the politicians do? Well, the politicians, they like to see things like that. And they like to go, oh, look, over in Al's neighborhood, they're all bent out of shape over financial freedom. They're bent out of shape. They're, they're worried the government isn't going to be there for them for their financial freedom. Let's exploit that. Let's exploit that. As a matter of fact, we'll get everybody looking at that so that when we don't want them looking over here, they won't look over there. And we'll be able to pull the wool over their eyes. And if you believe that the government is responsible for your financial freedom, I need to help you pull that wool back off of your eyes because that is a misnomer. That is a phantom myth that really doesn't fly very well. And here's why in your lifetime, in your entire lifetime, how many times were you able to just stop earning money or stop doing something to trade something with someone else so that they would give you something that you needed so that you could sustain yourself. When's when's the last time that happened? Think about it. Now, I'm, I'm serious about this. I want you to go deep. I want you to think about that because the answer for most of us is, uh, pretty much never, pretty much never. Yeah. The, the government just doesn't, arbitrarily feed me and clothe me and take care of me and tuck me into bed. That's not the government's responsibility. Now the government does have a mechanism in place where it provides for social welfare systems. And I think social welfare systems are appropriate to a certain degree. I really do. I think that social welfare systems should be there to help fellow Americans when they really have a really bad run of luck or or run of whatever it is that 
there is something there that should allow them to fall back and maybe rebound a little bit. But I'm going to blow your mind. I, I don't. I don't think the government should be providing that. I don't think they should. I think fellow Americans should be providing that. I think fellow Americans that care about their fellow Americans should be providing that. Not the government. Yet, in our current situation in this country, that's kind of what's going on. We have developed somewhat of a, I hate to say it, but a a need, or maybe a better word, is a dependency. We have depended on the government to take care of us sometimes. And that is a bad idea. I think that's a really bad idea. Because when people are dependent on things, they don't learn how to stop being dependent on things. That's really the source of addiction. If you look at what addiction is, addiction is essentially you making a decision in your mind that you need something that you're not already getting. And you will do anything in your power to go get that. That's addiction. And unfortunately in this country, what tends to happen is is we have people that are born into this country or they immigrate to this country. And however they get to this country, they're in this country and they hopefully are starting to assimilate to what we are as Americans and not bringing in some bad ideas from elsewhere. But, you know, sometimes those trickle in. But having said all of that, you start going to work and trading time for money because that's what you've been told success looks like. And then you get through an entire lifetime and you get to a certain age, a certain age, we'll call it 65, because the government says you can retire at 65. Well, how are you going to retire? Oh, Social Security? Doesn't that mean you're dependent on the government? We come back from the break. I'm going to dig into this a little more. Stick around. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Now, let's get back to your map to financial freedom. Welcome back to the show. So if you remember last week, I was talking to you about how the Social Security Administration has announced it is granting all recipients a 5.9% raise. Remember me talking about that last week? You know, and and it kind of comes off as, hey, the government's got your back. Uncle Sam's got your back. Here's an extra 5.9% money coming January 1st to your bank account because we care about you because we're the United States government. Yeah, I'm not sure that's the way it works. As a matter of fact, I believe it works in a different way. I actually believe that it works in a different way. And you're thinking, okay, where are you going with this? Because there's no way you could get to where you think you're going based on what you just said. I know that's what makes radio so fun, isn't it? So let's think about it. Let's think about it. You start off in this country, going to school, being educated by people that teach you what right looks like. You get into the workforce. Because you've realized that you're not independently wealthy and nobody left you a big bag of money for you to live off of your entire life. So what do you do? Well, you do what every other human being does. You go out and you trade time for something else. In other words, you give something of value from yourself and exchange it with someone else who gives you something for value. I mean, back... Way back in the Flintstone days, that's how commerce began. Somebody figured out that if they could grow some vegetables that no one else could grow, but they could grow a lot of them, more than they really needed, they could take those vegetables to a common place, like a market, for instance, 
where other people might be coming with different goods and services doing the same thing you're doing. So you show up at that marketplace, you've got all your basket full of vegetables, and there's somebody over there with a basket full of fruit. Wouldn't it be nice to have some fruit in your diet? I think it would. So you go over and you strike up a conversation with the fruit vendor, and you agree to terms, and based on those terms, you walk away with some fruit, the fruit vendor walks away with some vegetables. That's, that's how it all begins, folks. That's been going on for a very, very, very long time. Now, in today's modern society, or at least our version of a modern society, we have accelerated that process. We have made it so people can become employees. They can go into the workforce. The government is right there watching over you, making sure that they're taking 15.5% of your money in the form of Social Security and Medicare taxes. And you're thinking, wait a minute, Al, they don't take a 15.5%. They only take out like 7.65%. Okay, you are correct from your side of the equation. Your employer pays the same amount in addition to what they're putting in your check. So the government starts extracting money. You heard me correctly. Extracting money from you to set aside for something called Social Security. The, the concept is we create this giant fund. We have people that are young and vibrant, that are working, that pay into that fund. And over a lifetime, that fund will build up. It will build up to a massive amount of money so that we can bring more and more and more people into that fund. It will become a giant slush fund for which everyone will have financial freedom. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Let me just be very clear with you how much it doesn't work. I was reading an article yesterday. Remember, I was talking about Yahoo News the other day. I think it was yesterday. Anyway, it doesn't matter about Yahoo News other than the fact I need to cite them because I actually did read one of their articles that was kind of interesting. And what this article was doing, it was telling me the places that I could live if I had a fixed income of $1,500 a month. $1,500 per month. Now, why is that significant? How much money do you think current Social Security recipients bring in? How much money do you think they actually bring in? It's, it's not crazy money, trust me. I just buried somebody that was living off of 900, and I think she was getting $970 a month in 2020. She passed away not too long after that. Try living off of that. She was living off of that, but she actually had a little extra help. One of the things that she was the recipient of was the fact that her longtime life partner, he left her ownership in a piece of real estate. And that piece of real estate was producing cash flow for her well after he passed away. See, he passed away at the age of 75. She was 71 when he passed away. She was almost 90 when she passed away. So you can do the math. So from the age of 71 to almost 90, she was living off of Social Security plus the passive income that this real estate asset was producing for her. I'm here to tell you, had she had to live off of the Social Security that she paid into her entire working life in her, in her later years, she would have been living with me. She would have been living with me. There, there's no way she could. Now, she lived in California of all places. There's no way she could sustain herself 
on less than a thousand dollars a month. Yet I'm reading this article that Yahoo News puts out talking about the places that you can go live where you can actually live on $1,500 a month. And here's what I thought was just, and I'm not even going to tell you where these places are because to be honest with you, that's not the focus of this show. I don't want you thinking about where you can go live so that you can get by on $1,500 a month. That's not what I'm trying to share with you here. What I'm trying to share with you is the, 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 the stupidity of the common knowledge in this country that the government is here to take care of you. They are not here to take care of you. Read your constitution. It doesn't say in the constitution, I will make sure Al is financially free the rest of his life. That's not in there. You're not in there either. Okay, I'm getting all worked up. So, when we come back from the break, why don't we just talk about some solutions? Should we do that? Let's do it. I'll be back right after this. Listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show will change your life. We will teach you how to create wealth and passive income so you can be financially free. And now, back to your host. Welcome back to the show. So you're dying. You're just dying to hear all the solutions that I've laid out for you, right? You're, you're dying to hear them, right? Okay. Well, check this out. I actually gave you the solution in the last segment. I did. I, I totally did. Were you listening? Yeah, I, I was talking about my aunt who had been living off Social Security, but she was also living off of the income streams that came from the passive income off an investment in real estate that her lifelong love partner left to her. And she lived off of that asset for almost 20 years supplementing Social Security. See, if you really get into the nuts and bolts about what Social Security is really intended to be, it's supposed to be a, a supplement. It's intended to give you a little bit extra. The idea is retirement, that's your problem. It's totally your problem. But somewhere along the way in this country, probably in the last 100 years, things went a little sideways. The government decided it could fix everything for everyone. I am big government. Ah, ah. Yeah, FDR. Yeah, the New Deal. Yeah, you remember those back in the 30s, right? Yeah, almost 90 years ago, they passed all this legislation that was designed to help America come out of, well, a, a couple of bad periods. First of all, we had World War I, okay? Now, we didn't fight World War I on our turf. We took it over to their turf, but we still fought the war. And this country took enormous emotional and economic casualties during World War I. But it was so long ago, we don't even think about it. It was over 100 years ago, right? That's so far in the past. Yet I guarantee you there are people alive today that remember the effects of World War I. And then, and then what happened? Well, we had the Roaring Twenties, right? Not this version that we're having right now. I'm talking about the one that happened 100 years ago. What was going on? The stock market was doing great. There were no rules in place. There were no controls in place. The stock market was like Vegas on steroids without the roulette machines. And of course, I don't think slot machines had been invented back then, but had they been, that's what Wall Street was like. I firmly believe that's what Wall Street was like. Now, I think Wall Street was intended to be a place for companies to raise capital so that they could raise the capital and actually go out and do the business of the business and provide returns for their investors. I truly believe that that was the original intent of the stock market, but that doesn't seem to be the intent anymore, does it? 
because the stock market's all about put your money in, watch it go up. Hopefully it doesn't go down. Stock market's great. We never have problems with the stock market, right? Well, that's, that's what they were thinking through the 1920s. Through the 1920s, it was wonderful. It was everybody was making money everywhere. It was awesome until 1929. And in 1929, we had a little thing called a massive stock market crash. Something they never thought would ever happen in the 20s happened at the end of the 20s in 1929. And it devastated many, many, many people. And I'm not just talking about the people that were actually invested in the stock market. I'm talking about all the people that were running businesses or were working for other people in those businesses who were affected because all of a sudden the bottom fell out of the markets. There was no capital available. The banks were shutting down. People were standing in line to get bread. Yeah, those pictures you've seen, those are real. Those are real pictures. People in my family were alive during that time period. I remember being told stories about that time period. It was not a good place to be financially in this country. Now, not everybody was affected, but about 70%, at least 70% were materially affected. That means seven out of 10 people, they didn't know where, where to go. They just didn't know where to go. So they went to the bread lines. Yeah, because back then, remember, retirement, that's your problem. You know, what you need to do, you need to raise yourself a family. Because once you get yourself a family, then you're going to have yourself some kids. So that when you get old, they'll take care of you. Otherwise, we're just going to have to put you on that ice float like the Eskimos are rumored to do and send you off into the Pacific. So the government said, well, we can't have that. We can't have that at all. That's, that's bad for America. As a matter of fact, what we as the government need to do right now in the 30s, we need to grow government. We need to start spending a lot of money in this country so that we can bring the economy back. And in the process, one of the things that we're going to do, because we need money to do all of this stuff, we're going to introduce a little thing. We're going to call it the income tax. Yeah, we're going to call it the income tax. Now, nobody has ever heard of this before. Yeah, people's income have never been taxed in this country up to this point. But we're just going to slip it in. We're going to slide it through and we're going to sell it as it's necessary for everybody to give a little bit so that we can get this country back on track. And what did America do? Oh, well, they bought into it. They bought into it. Whether it was right, wrong, or different, I'm not saying it was right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm just saying that's what happened. I can't change the past. I will not reinvent the facts for you. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. And when they slid this little income tax in on everybody, it was too late. Because once we got the economy working again. Once, once businesses were able to go back into a, a place of being flourishing and they were able to hire more people and expand their businesses and provide more employment opportunities for other people so that people could, could have viable work because that's how we operate in this country. While all of this was happening, people got their first paycheck and they noticed some money had been taken out in the form of income tax. Oh, but wait, but wait, social security. When did that occur? You're all wondering, when did we start paying into social security? Well, I'm going to let you ponder that for a minute. I'm going to let you figure out when that actually occurred. Now I will tell you, Medicare didn't come along until much later. It didn't come along until much later. And it was a response to essentially, I don't know, it might have been a national emergency or it might be something the government does, which is fabricate national emergencies. In whatever case, whatever case 
it was the government made a decision that they needed to add on an additional tax for Medicare. So now you you have all of this money starting to come out of people's checks over time. And over time, we as human beings, well, we start getting conditioned to that. We start getting conditioned to that. As a matter of fact, I remember when I had my first real job, my first real W-2 job. I was working fast food. I was making $3.05 an hour. I was all that in a bag of chips. And when I got that first check, I looked at that and I was like, man, I was going to get all this money because I worked X number of hours. And I went, wait a minute, it's not adding up. Wait a minute, what's this? Tax? Social Security? Medicare? Holy smokes, they're taking my money. Back right after this. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. It's time to turn up the volume and fine-tune your passive income plan so you can create the lifestyle you've always wanted. Welcome back to the show. All right. Here's the answer to the question. For all of you that said August 14th, 1935, you're right. That's when President Roosevelt signed the Social Security Administration Act. Yeah, he created something called the Social Security Board. Yeah, and and these are the people that went to work to put together the Social Security program as we know it. Yeah, this, this wonderful thing that throughout my entire life, about every three or four years, somebody steps up on a national platform and says, I don't think Social Security is going to be around for me to use it. I've been hearing that all my life. As a matter of fact, I was listening to Andy Webb the other day. He, he's one of the uh, other Lifestyles Unlimited real estate investor radio show hosts. You've probably been hearing him during the week because part of the reason you're hearing those guys in addition to me is I don't have all the answers. I'll be very honest with you. I don't have the answers to everything. And those guys are super sharp. I mean, I really love having those guys as co-hosts because I'll tell you, Andy... Man, I'll tell you what, you want to talk about a tactician as far as getting it done on the single family side? Man, that guy is good. And then Mike, I mean, you want to talk about a well-grounded guy that that understands financial markets and stuff. And, and once he realized the lie that society had been feeding him and he got to work changing that, holy smokes, he's got great outcomes. And these are great guys. And they're like me. They want to share with you this great information about what we found at Lifestyles Unlimited. But let me get back to Andy. So the point I was going to make is that Andy pointed out something of great importance. Great importance. And at the end of the day, if you didn't hear it, well, you didn't hear it. And I'm not, I'm not saying it that way to be, to be crass or anything. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going down that lane. My point is this. When you go to work and you spend your time at work dealing with all the things and all of the pressures and all of the time demands that work puts on you. And then when you're done with your work week and you go home, if you're allowed to go home, you're probably pretty exhausted. And chances are you've been doing this job so long. The, the original hiring package where they sat you down and said, Hey man, we love you. You're, you're awesome. You're the best thing going. We, we got to get you on board with this, this uh, organization because you know, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars and here's your, here's your blah, 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 blah compensation package. And you're thinking, wow, this is great because numbers are bigger than the last job. This is going to be awesome. Woohoo! And then what do you do? You take the job and you start getting into the process and you start realizing this new job maybe is making more money than the last job. So what do you do? Do you take that extra money and you set it aside for investment in the future? No, you go out and go buy that bigger car. You get the wife, her bigger car, or maybe it's time to get the kids a used car because you're tired of driving the kids around and they're old enough to drive themselves. Oh, and by the way, you got to pay for insurance for all that. And you know, and that's my point. 
The point I'm trying to make is that we get ourselves into this cycle. Wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. I just got to get through the week. And then we get through the week. And then instead of looking at our paycheck and going, hmm, I make X amount of dollars, but the government takes 20 some odd percent out for income tax. And then they take another 7.65% out for Social Security and Medicare. That's a lot of my money they're taking. What are they doing with it? Well, I will guarantee you this. That money that they're taking out of your check, they're just doing with it what they deem appropriate. You know that, right? Yeah, so the money that comes out as far as income tax, that goes to the general fund. That goes to the treasury. That's, so, that's money so that Congress can approve appropriations yeah, I don't want to get into this whole mumbo-jumbo on how the United States economy works, but basically Congress is the arm of the government that writes all the checks. Yeah, it's not the president, it's, it's the Congress. Congress controls the purse. And they're also the ones that make the decisions on what they're going to spend that money on. And, you know, you may or may not get a say in what your money gets spent on. Yeah, it's just the way it works. So what do we do is, as Americans, we go, oh, that's, that's sunk money. I'll never get it back. But then we look at Social Security and Medicare, and we go, oh, 7.65. Oh, well, I'm putting money aside. And then every year, what does Social Security do? They send you that little annual statement, right, going, hey, if you, like, retired right now, this is how much money you could get. Yeah. Well, I get, I get one of those statements every year, too. And you know what? The money that Social Security is indicating that I will draw at the age of 70 if I decide to hold out to my max age is still less money than I receive from my pension that I earned after serving 27 years in the military and couldn't live off of. Yeah, so here's my point. Two government paychecks, still not going to answer the mail. So how do we resolve that? How do we fix that? Well, we stop doing what everybody else is doing. What we start doing is we start realizing that we have a problem. We have a problem. And that problem is our life. That problem is our life because we are doing everything based on what we think is right without any vision for the future. And you don't want to get to that place in the future and realize that your big bag of money that you saved up isn't enough to live off of. So how do you fix that? How do you stop the bleeding? Well, you learn how to invest correctly into real estate. That's the solution. And I'm not just saying, oh yeah, real estate, I, I can do this, man. Real estate's not hard. You just go buy a house, put, put a resident in there. You know, collect checks, easy, right? It sounds easy. And it is easy if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, there's all kinds of problems looming out there waiting to bite you on the back of the neck and just rip your flesh off. Yeah, yeah, that's what goes on in the industry. And unfortunately, there are too many people that get into the industry that don't have a sound education on how to invest and operate in investment properties. They don't know what they're doing and they make a mess of it. And unfortunately, the messes that they make, everybody hears about. And as everybody hears about all of these messes, everybody goes, Ah, oh, real estate, that's bad. You're going to lose your shirt. My Uncle Bob over there, he lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, Bob was maybe not as smart as you think. Maybe Bob was not a member of Lifestyles Unlimited. Meaning Bob never had the opportunity to go through the financial freedom education course that we provide. And there's a reason we call it the Financial Freedom Education Course or Seminar. And there's a reason why we call it Financial Freedom. Because unlike the government, we're actually going to teach you what works. And unlike the government, we're not going to say, well, you have to spend 12 years in grade school, followed by four years in baccalaureate college, followed by two years in master's program, followed by three or more years in a PhD program. Oh, and you can go back and earn as many more degrees as you want. No, we need 16 hours. 
Yeah, we're not going to fill your brain full of a bunch of theory and stuff that's time filler stuff. No, we're going to give you 16 hours of a solid education, the education that you need so that you can go out the next day and literally start building your life from scratch. You start changing what you are doing, and then you go out and you buy that first real estate asset, and you go through the process of acquiring that asset. And you got your mentor right there helping you. And you know what? Everything's going okay. You got a few little glitches that happen, but hey, that's what happens in real estate. And now you've got that property fully renovated. You've got that wonderful resident in place that you properly screened. So you found the best person available out there and amongst a lot of people that wanted to rent your property because you got the nicest thing on the market. And now this thing is paying you Every month, your resident knows that rent is due on the first and they pay you on the first and you make all the subsequent operational payments to support that property. And what's left over is something called cash flow. Now, that cash flow, that $400 that's in your hand or in your checking account or wherever you keep that cash flow, that's your money. You do with it what you want. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to put it back into the retirement account like you do with that 401k or that IRA. No, that, that's your money. Oh, and here's the beautiful thing about that money. That money comes into your hand with a little thing called depreciation attached to it, meaning you're taking a write-off on the physical improvements on the property, which the government expects you to take, by the way. As a matter of fact, they, they will give you grief if you don't take it. And what, what happens is that $400 that you made is now mostly tax-free. You're not going to pay taxes on it now and probably not for a very long time. It's just a matter of how many we need to get you to. Let's get you started. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.